Welcome to the second video of the series where we're going to take a look at an overview of an ATR-72-600 aircraft and its systems. The origins of the aircraft we see sitting before us today stemmed from the rapid price rise of crude oil back in the late 70s and early 80s. It essentially made jet-powered airliners uneconomic to operate on shorter sectors, and airline owners looked for alternative means of transportation that was going to give them back their profit margins. Several European countries designed and built turboprop aircraft to meet this market demand, but it's been the ATR that has stood the test of time. The ATR is a joint venture between Airbus, formerly Aerospatiale, and Leonardo, formerly Aeritalia. The fuselages are built in Italy, the rest of the components built in France, and final assembly takes place at a factory in Toulouse. The first ATR-42, with 42 seats, entered service back in 1985, and proved to be so popular that ATR stretched the fuselage and created the ATR-72. Production of the 72 has been ongoing since 1988, with over a thousand of the type built to date. The Dash 600 designation indicates the latest variant of the ATR to roll off the production line from 2010 onward. Amongst other things, it features an all-new glass cockpit with tireless avionics that have an RMP 0.3 navigation accuracy capability. The aircraft is 89 feet long, has a wingspan of 88 feet, and the tail sits 25 feet high. It has two sets of six-bladed Hamilton standard props with a diameter of 12 feet. There are 72 seats on board, hence the name, 68 for passengers, two for pilots, plus a jump seat, and two for cabin crew. The 72 has a maximum takeoff weight of 23 tonnes and can carry a maximum payload of 7,400 kilograms. Here we are on the flight deck of the ATR-72, which shouldn't look too unfamiliar to those of you who've flown Airbus aircraft before. The cockpit design is similar to the likes of the A320 and A380, with an overhead panel that shows all of the aircraft systems in a schematic layout. Below the windscreens is the flight guidance control panel, with the autopilot mode selectors. And below this, there are five display unit screens, with a primary flight display, an interchangeable navigation and system display for each pilot. In the centre is the engine warning display screen which shows engine parameters, electronic checklists and contains a flight warning system alerter. Below this are two MCDUs which interface with the Talos 220 FMSs. Both of these units cross talk to one another so that when data gets input on one MCDU it shows on both sides. Next is the throttle stack with the parking brake, power levers, condition levers and flap selector. Below this are the controls for the MFD, the EWD checklists, the common nav radio volume controls, an ACARS printer and the covered rotary selector for the ATPCS or automatic takeoff power control system. The aircraft is powered by two Pratt & Whitney 127M engines with 2500 shaft horsepower per side. Much like the modern Airbus airliners, the ATR has a power management selector with power levers pushed into a detent on takeoff and a rotary selector then controlling the percentage of engine power output. These positions are takeoff, max continuous, climb, and cruise. An extra 250 horsepower is available for RTO power by pushing the power levers forward of the detent in case of a performance limiting emergency. Two condition levers control propeller speed and fuel flow to the engines with detents for fuel shut off, feather, also an override. In the feather detent, propeller speed or NP will stabilise at 14.5%. On the ground in auto it will increase to 70.8% but will also allow the power manager selector to take over control of NP speed. At takeoff it will increase to 100% and then come back to 82% when either climb or cruise is selected by the crew. If condition levers are pushed all the way forward to override, MP gets set to 100%, which is used for landing in gusty wind conditions or when escaping severe ice conditions. Hotel mode is a unique feature to the ATR and serves as a weight and cost effective alternative to having an APU. A hydraulically powered propeller brake attached to engine 2 allows for it to be run without the propeller turning. This provides electrical power and air conditioning whilst the aircraft is parked on the ground. The process for starting engine 2 in hotel mode is as follows. Firstly, 
we must make sure that the service door on the rear right hand side of the fuselage is closed and the orange unlock light is extinguished. We then push engine 2's fuel pump to run, come down to the propeller brake, unguard it, switch it to the on position, reguard it and notice prop brake illuminates in blue. On the engine start selector we rotate the dial to either start A, start B or start A and B and then push the start to button on. Now we drop down to the system display and watch engine 2 NH rise above 10% before bringing condition lever 2 from fuel shutoff to feather. We can see NH continue to rise, ITT rise, oil pressure and oil temperature rise along with fuel flow. Notice that MP remains at zero throughout this process. Once NH and ITT stabilize we can come back to the engine start selector rotate it to the off start abort position and then deselect ground power. For electrical power the aircraft has two DC batteries, a DC external power jack and two DC generators that all feed a 28 volt DC system. Two inverters are attached to the system to produce AC power. There is also two AC wild frequency alternators which come online when MP is above 66% and provide AC wild power between 115 and 200 volts. Bus ties between each engine allow for both AC and DC power to be shared between systems when only one of each generator is online. The ATR has two hydraulic systems, designated blue and green, which are both pressurised by AC wild electrical pumps. The green system controls landing gear extension and retraction and actuation of normal foot brakes. The blue system controls nose wheel steering, flat movement, the spoilers, emergency and parking brakes and the propeller brake. An auxiliary pump button that is controlled by DC power is located on the central pedestal and allows the blue system to be pressurised on the ground with both engines stopped to turn on the propeller brake whilst parked. Fuel is stored in two tanks, one in each wing with a total capacity of 5000 kilograms. Inside each main tank is a small vent surge tank and a feeder tank which will always be full to prevent the engine feed system from starvation due to negative g-loading. Each wing tank has an electrical fuel pump which should be pushed into the run setting for engine start. The feed low pressure amber lights above them will extinguish as the fuel pressure line rises above 4 psi. Once the fuel line is pressurised, an internal feeder jet pump will be activated to draw fuel into the feeder tank and keep it full. Fuel can be crossfed between tanks via the push button on the overhead panel. The pump on the tank you are feeding from should be turned off during this time. Fuel quantity and fuel used is shown on the EWD as well as on the fuel system display page. The ATR airframe is certified to fly into light and moderate environmental icing conditions and has both anti-icing and de-icing systems to prevent performance loss during flight and visible moisture at cold temperatures. These include pneumatically inflatable main wing, tailplane and engine air intake boots, electrically heated aileron and elevator horns, propeller blades, windshields, cockpit side windows and pitot-static sensor probes. Standard practice is to turn on the anti-icing systems when flying through cloud or rain with an outside air temperature below 8 degrees Celsius. This will put the aircraft into the icing speed regime whereby the angle of attack for the stall warning is reduced. Icing AOA will illuminate in green on the FMA strip along with the Icing AOA button on the panel to the left of the EWD. When ice is observed building up on the aircraft, the icing should be turned on and the ice accretion checklist actioned. The ice evidence probe located outside of the captain's side window is the last place on the airframe that I should melt off from, so the aircraft should be flown under icing speeds until this probe is completely clear. Once that happens, the AOA button can be pushed to turn off and normal speed parameters can be flown again. Finally, there is the pneumatic system, which uses pressurised air to supply air conditioning, the pressurisation system, compartment ventilation and de-icing boots. Pressurised air is taken from each of the engine's compressors fed through low and high pressure valves into a pack that contains a cooling unit. 
The air gets output from the pack into a mixing chamber with ambient air before being distributed to the cabin and flight compartment. In normal operations, the ATR is clever enough to calculate the pressure differential required to keep the airframe pressurised within a max diff of 6.35 psi up to a certified ceiling of flight level 250. All the flight crew are required to do is set the landing elevation of their destination airport on the pressurisation panel prior to departure. If you are interested in seeing some much more extensive presentations around the ATR systems, look up Fly with Magna on YouTube. He was involved as a consultant on the Microsoft ATR development and has highly detailed explanations of all of the aforementioned systems and more on his channel. This concludes video 2 for the series. Next up, we'll have a look at some of the functionality Microsoft have built in to make the ATR a little bit more user friendly with inside of Flight Simulator. See you on the next one.